Sure. Um, but an amazing talent. Yeah, an amazing, talent. yeah, an amazing person, just period. I mean, the guy was so talented. I mean, he could sit there in the story mode sequences and you could just see him sing. It was amazing. And he was a great guy just to talk to on a personal level. Um, I just love the guy so much, and he taught me so much. So we, we miss him very much. <laughs> I think, Kelly, you were a little jealous, maybe. Joe, of Joe. <laughs> um, to be jealous of Joe Ramps would be, you know, it's hard to, I have to admit, it is really difficult to to verbalize about Joe Ramps. He, I think everyone that knew him uh, knows what a great loss it was, and it was a sudden, a sudden loss, and uh, it, it's, it's really actually, I have a hard time publicly speaking about him because he was a mentor of mine from the day I started in the business, and anyone that ever knew Joe, uh, he was your friend. Uh, and he was a loss, and he still is a loss. So, that's all I can that's it. He was a saint, and he's also a twisted motherfucker. <laughs> in the best possible way. So, Anthony, when I got involved in Caroline, I had never, I, I realized that, although intellectually I'd realized that stop motion filmmaking was a slow and <laughs> tedious process, the version of it in my head was sort of zooming like Concord compared to the real thing, which was so much slower <coughs> and more gloriously tedious than I could ever have imagined. Um, could you talk a little about what animators... Let me, let me. How long did it take you to break Coraline? Uh, ten years. <laughs> <laughs> but for a lot of that time, I wasn't writing it. <laughs> Whereas you guys just... You, I, I remember the thing that shocked me was discovering that animators rehearse. That before you do it, you do it. And that had never occurred to me, the idea that you do it before you did it. As it were. <laughs> so, um, tell us a little bit about what animators go through. Is this thing on? Hello? Hello. Um, yeah, we, we have to know where we're going with the performance because we're basically the actor. We're breathing life into all these characters. We have to know what the puppet's capable of, so we will do a test. A pop through, we call it, where we get certain poses, key poses, see under the real lights. And that gives us an idea of where to go, what's going to work, and we can review it with the director and make changes from that. But yeah, a good day when I'm doing full animation, a really good day is about two seconds of animation. So you just, it's, I don't find it necessarily tedious. It, you have to put your head in a certain slow motion mode and just focus on that frame. It's a lot like reading a book. You start on page one, move on to the next page, and just keep going until you get to the end. It's the same thing with stop motion. You just do the same thing from the beginning of the shot till the end, and you have, and then you watch it as it goes. You see this this performance happen before your eyes. It's it's, a, it's pretty magical for me. What was your favorite moment as an animator? On Nightmare? Uh, well, on Nightmare or on Nightmare? Yeah, Nightmare. Um, I was able to. Uh, I was privileged to animate the poor Jack sequence in. When Jack's in the graveyard after he's been shot down and he's on the angel statue he's singing with his uh, Santa suit all ripped up. And uh, when I read the script, actually, I really was drawn to that whole sequence because that's when Jack is, he realizes who he is and what his, you know, what his power, where his power is. And he knows who he is and uh, he basically turns. He, it's a big transition scene. So I, I, I love that when I read it and I asked Henry if I could animated and I spent six months animating that every day and go into the graveyard and animate Jack and yeah it's still one of my favorite things to watch that I've done. We didn't tell Anthony during that time at the end there was a consideration of cutting out that whole sequence <laughs> and luckily Henry decided never to get rid of it but there was some discussion at that time and we didn't want to traumatize Anthony. So, yeah, point of that. <laughs> so Edie, as an, as an editor what are the big differences editing stop motion as compared to editing a normal motion film or, or, or an animated film? What, what well, changes? There's a 
fundamental difference in live action and animation editing, which is animation is so labor intensive. The two seconds that Anthony was talking about animating, that's 48 individual frames that he's capturing a day. And in order to, to capture 48 frames in live action is just turning the camera on. So the amount of pre-planning you have to do to economize on the animator's time because they can only do two seconds a day at their fastest um, is crucial. So you have to cut storyboards, test them out, cut them against dialogue, make sure that um, it works and Henry's happy with it before it goes on to the next stage. If you go off you know, and, and animate material before an idea has gelled, you're going to end up having a lot of that material on the cutting room floor. And that's not an affordable thing when you're dealing with such a small amount of material for a week or a day. I like how cutting room floor doesn't really work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Just a bunch of extra. But we shot Nightmare on film and we actually, and, and, and everything was done on film and cut. And it was Everything's an changed since amazing then. challenge because the amount of um, automation that we're afforded now with digital nonlinear editing makes changes easy, versioning easy. Everything is pretty instantaneous. When we um, had a jack animation pass and a zero animation pass, we'd have to get a special processing from the lab um, of reversal and put the two strips of film together in the editing machine with a light behind it so Henry could see the relationship of Jack and Zero in every single frame mechanically as we would go through frame by frame. I've got to be rude once more, it's my nature. There was never, uh, none of the, the, the finished songs were ever going to be cut. What was, what really happened was early on, all the songs were coming in, and I and I went to Tim and I said, I'm a little concerned if the audience will be able to handle like 10 and a half songs, you know, 10 with a reprise. And um, before anything was, was actually animated, and Tim said, well, you know, we'll just animate, but we'll cut it like a live action. If there's too many, then we'll cut them out. But at the end, when everything was finished, he said, you know, you might have been right. Maybe we need to cut one or two songs, and there's, not many times where I could rise up without saying a single word and get Tim to back down, but that was the time. I felt like, not just that we'd put the hard work in, but I felt the film would lose a, an arm, a leg, part of its soul by, by cutting any, any of those. Just have to let them. So storyboarding has been a huge part of making animated films um, ever since the early Disney days, possibly even before. What's the process like of translating the story to storyboards and then off the page, onto the sets? Why don't we start down at the end with Kelly? Storyboarding is really, the storyboards and the story reel that are made from them are all, the, you start with a script, but really that's just a jump off point to the storyboards and 